Uh, I was extremely nervous with about year 20 people and delighted some of them turned up. Uh, my name is Simon Millon. Um, I've chaired the meeting. Uh, my job here is to facilitate the meeting, not to make any other contribution except to let you make the contribution and to get the audience participating. Um, to begin with, I really want to lay down the parameters for managing, time managing this meeting. Um, what you're going to have is a list of speakers. I'll, I'll call them all around. I think I'll request the speakers should sit here because I think I'm nervous about this cameras pointing in this direction. We don't want to film them, so fine. It's okay by me. Um, the speakers will speak for seven minutes. And, 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 and after we've taken all the speakers, I need to leave enough time for contribution from the floor. Uh, I think the sound system is working, so when you're speaking and contributing from the floor, make sure the mic's on. There's a button on, I think, on the right. Okay? And then, you know, that'd be very important. This meeting is about you making a contribution as well. Uh, issues are extremely important. And, and so, so that's what I'm looking for at the end of the meeting. The aims of the meeting are very clear. If you look at the leaflet, it, it sets up the aims of the meeting. I don't want to repeat the aims of the meeting at all. So I think we should, we should kick off now. And I have a difficult job of getting the, uh, the order of the, of the speakers. But I have one person who is very kind enough to book this room. This is George Bennett over there. His wife is unwell and he needs to get away fairly quickly by 7.30. So I'm going to invite him uh, to speak first, George. By the way, he's the branch secretary of Kevin Unison. And he's an excellent comrade. He always works for us. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Sally, for the kind words and introduction. And thanks to everyone for braving the inclement weather this evening to come to what I certainly agree is a very important meeting about what I viewed as an unprecedented threat to the right of citizenship. I presume that most everyone was either already familiar with the basics of of Mr. Haji's case, but in case you're not, this is one of the very, very rare instances of which I'm aware of anyone in Britain who has received citizenship in the United Kingdom being stripped of it, and being stripped of it by the British Home Office without a single meaningful word of explanation. Now, Mr. Haji was one of a number of young men approached by agents, apparently from MI5, the Internal Security Service in Britain, in 2009. One of a number of young Somali men associated with the Kentish Town Community Organization in particular. And the MI5 agents attempted to, quote, persuade, unquote, him and the other young men to become informers or face the prospect of accusations of terrorist links. Now, I personally do not know what has transpired in this young man's life in the period since 2009 when the national media, and in particular, the independent newspaper, expressed a real interest in the story and even made it into a front page article. <coughs> Three years on, there is barely a peep in the regional or national media about this case. Aside from the coverage by Tom Foote in the Camden New Journal, from whom you'll be hearing later this evening, I am not aware of any coverage in what you might call a mainstream newspaper of what has transpired in this young man's life. He has been stripped, with the authorization of Home Secretary Theresa May, of his citizenship. He has been detained at a site, as far as I know, still unknown in East Africa, and most recently, sometime in the final quarter of last year, being taken 
the United States and is currently detained facing charges after a grand jury indictment was issued in Brooklyn, New York. His family, to the best of my knowledge, has been kept completely in the dark about his loss of citizenship and about what can only be deemed rendition. Now, as I'm the first speaker, I've recited some of the basic facts of this case, and I'm sure there are others here who are far better equipped than I to outline more. But why am I here this evening? Well, I travel on this passport. It's a United States passport. Although I've lived in this country for 30 years, I've never taken out British citizenship. I have a definite leave to remain. I'm a permanent resident. But when I first heard of this case, I was reminded of how fragile so-called permanent resident status must now be if you are one who chooses to stick his or her head above the parapet. Now, I'm a trade union activist, and I think some would brand me a trade union militant. And I have no compunction about taking to the streets and urging others to do so, mounting picket lines and attempting to persuade others not to cross them, against the backdrop of the so-called age of austerity, and a coalition government, which despite the Liberal Democrats' supposed concerns with civil liberties, has continued a pace with the erosion of civil liberties, and of course has unleashed huge attacks on public sector spending and on the workers who deliver public services. Now, I'm white, I'm North American, I'm not Muslim. Do I have anything to worry about? Well, personally, yes, I think I do. But I also think there's a basic duty of solidarity for trade union activists in this country to defend basic civil liberties, including the rights of citizenship. And I'm particularly concerned, working in Greater London, where more and more I see some of the best trade union activists coming from migrant communities, <clears throat> particularly in this borough, cleaners from Latin America, traffic wardens from Africa, including Somalia, who have been involved in industrial action and in protests. Many of these people have insecure immigration status. What happens next? Can they be stripped of their citizenship or their permanent residence? Can they be deported simply for becoming involved politically, becoming involved in industrial struggles in this country? I don't think it's a far-fetched scenario anymore. And finally, for those of you who aren't familiar with the history of working class struggles in this country, it's not so very long ago that we witnessed not simply the Metropolitan Police sending in undercover agents to infiltrate environmental groups and so-called anarchist cells, and then witnessing undercover agents becoming involved in sexual relationships with people whom they were keeping under surveillance. And just under 30 years ago in this country, MI5, the same organization that sent its agents to approach young Somali men in Camden, was busy spreading smear stories about the leadership of the National Union of Mine Workers and its supporters during a strike that lasted for one year in opposition to the closure of pits and the loss of tens and tens of thousands of jobs. It was a struggle that ultimately, from my perspective, the good guys and gals lost. But one of the reasons they lost was the work of MI5. And I'll wind up on, on this point and recommend to you an excellent book by Seamus Mill, entitled The Enemy Within, which was originally published in 1994, and it documents in considerable detail the combination of bribery, the use of agent provocateur, and obviously friends in the media to try and undermine the leadership from practically top to bottom of the National Union of Mine Workers during 1984 and 1985. Mm -hmm. The 
Security services are no friends of working people in Britain. And that is an important lesson that trade union activists in this country must appreciate and spread amongst their members across London and across Britain. That's why this case matters so much to me and should matter to the members whom I represent. And why I'm pleased to say that at least our branch, and I think our Trades Council in Camden, will come on board and support the campaign for the truth to be told about this case and to win back citizenship <coughs> rights for this young man and hopefully obtain his release from jail in the United States. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, George. Um, can, I, can I now call to the stage uh, Sarah Bill Long, director of KTCO? Is Sarah Bill here? Um, we, we're going to make it because it's the You're make it. flight cancelled. Are, are you going to stand in? Oh, yeah, I'll Please come, come to you. Can you introduce yourself? <coughs> Service. In upholding and defending 
our nation, we are uh, where, exact, uh, where exactly does targeting our own fellow citizens through unwarranted <coughs> blackmail or see you know orchestrating the torture of your own countrymen and women, no matter what their political uh, views are, or to deli uh, uh, deliberately uh, target minority communities with no strategic thinking on the long term, which may lead to hatred and distrust that is being created. <coughs> Uh, feature in an oath of allegiance you have taken. If our politicians are too stupid to realize the consequences of signing off authorizations in the name of national security without bothering to ask the difficult and obtain questions or frankly too submissive, lazy and dim to do their jobs as protectors of the state, surely your responsibility only increases to think <coughs> and act with caution and enforce discipline with other, with, within the ranks and not encourage a catalyst uh, and act, uh, behavior that gives way to a stasis agency. None of, of the criticism in any way takes away from the extremely important necessary work that you do uh, uh, for keeping us safe here in Britain. However, open season, on, open season on British Muslims, either by perception or reality, is damaging the national cohesion and its betrayal of the very democratic values we seek to uphold for which we are prepared to lay down our lives. The British Muslim community is not to be used as a soft target as part of the extension of the war in Afghanistan and Iraq. And for those officers who have continued to put a plan to overstep the boundaries, <coughs> chiefly, in the, uh, uh, chiefly in the belief that British Muslims constitute lesser inhabitants that have little need for respect and can be abused with impunity, I'm here to say that no matter how long it takes, there will be a day in court and those superiors for them you were following orders will be nowhere to be seen as has recently been demonstrated. For the government, I hold the utmost contempt for enacting xenophobic policies directly infringing on civil liberties and turning a blind eye to numerous attempts by community organisations to reach out and explain the impact of actions by the security services and police. The government's central role in enacting a divisive policies and the lack of general oversight due, uh, due to two trusting relationships, I lack, uh, a lack of oversight skills and general disdain for people uh, falling under this umbrella with a view of pay, uh, painting everyone with the same brush. To look at these representations through a microscope, however, or not, they can be <coughs> electoral gain and throwing those of those unfortunate in the society to the wolves is a, as irresponsible and uh, contemptible uh, as it is short-sighted and oblivious to the changing demographic uh, reality on the, on the ground, demographic reality on the ground. The case of our Rahman, the Tadah accent being rendered, yes, I purposely used the word against those, uh, against those that fit a profile worth saving white and middle class is uh, sympathetic of a uh, prime, min uh, prime minister happy to uh, allow in his neoconservative month despite a very changing world which has shown him to be uh, many places uh, behind global shaping events. We, we, have an, uh, we have an opportunity still to do, uh, to, uh, we have an opportunity still not only to do the right thing by Mahdi in uh, reinstating his citizenship and making strong uh, representation to the U.S. to have him return home at the earliest opportunity. And we have a very small window of opportunity to change shallow, self-defeating policies that will destroy decades of social cohesion. At a time when uh, despotic rulers use the withdrawal of citizenship as an oppressing tactic to stifle political dissent, will this government prove the world uh, prove to the world that Britain is willing to go back in the dark ages in terms of civil liberties and the rule of law and basic humanity? Or will we do what we once were respected for, a just and true nation that put the rule of law and human sanctity above all else? Finally, my message to all of you is thank you. And thank you for being here this evening. To all of these great organizations who are helping us again for making certain methods not forgotten. Please write to your MPs and government to do this proper role of protecting, uh, protecting and looking after its citizens and not where it is complicit in targeting the weak and vulnerable individuals because it is devoid of any feeling 
or responsibility, though it's clearly this for which any government is elected. Thank you.